Hello everybody and welcome to the first part of a two-part series. Today we're going to be looking at Jim Henson's Labyrinth. This first part is going to focus on the movie itself. The second part is going to focus primarily on the mythological and psychological aspects of the story. Wait a minute. Uh, is that right? I don't know. I've never understood it. Due to the nature of this video, I'm going to spoil everything from the movie. But it gets a lot worse from here on in. This is going to be your only chance to click away, so for those of you who have decided to stay but don't care about listening to the intro that I have here, you can use the chapter select in the description. Turn back before it's too late. So this video has taken me more than a month to make from start to finish, and I would like to thank my subscribers for waiting so patiently. I did not anticipate how long this video would be when I began this small project, but I do feel like my time was well spent. However, it was super exhausting. It's not often that I undertake something like this, but I was happy to try. This movie is filled with psychological importance, and to my knowledge, it's never been discussed. It's a fact that this film has its flaws, but it's also important to understand the significance of the writing throughout this story. I'm a firm believer that this movie, as well as many forms of art, contain hidden truths which should be explored. <laughs> You serious? I should clarify that this video is not a critique. It is an examination. I seek to understand more about stories in general and why we remember them. I want to connect this story to other stories that have come before it for the benefit of learning. Throughout this video, I'm going to use portions of clips from movies as well as pictures to illustrate my points. I'm going to leave a list in the description of books and websites that I use to arrive at my conclusions. I'm also going to give credit to the studios and or production companies of The Labyrinth in the description of this video, so I will hopefully not be subject to takedowns. Labyrinth is a movie that I've enjoyed watching for many years. It's a story about responsibility, friendship, and not taking your life, family, or friends for granted. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy. When I go see a film, when I leave the theater, I like a few things. I, I like to be happier than I was when I went in. I like a film to leave me with an up feeling. And I, and I like a picture to have a sense of substance. I like it to be about, about life, about, uh, about things that matter to me. And so I think that's what we were trying to do with this film, is trying to do a film that would make a difference to you if you saw it. So this is Jim Henson. If you haven't heard of him, you've probably heard of at least one of his many creations. He's the creator of Sesame Street, The Muppets, Dark Crystal, and a lot more. I would highly encourage you to look up his backstory because it's incredible. Before the Labyrinth's existence, Jim Henson was working on The Dark Crystal, an all-puppet feature film which had taken him about five years to make from start to finish. It was a project of unequaled magnitude, which Jim hadn't anticipated when he began working on The Dark Crystal. Despite this, Jim saw the project through and eventually finished it. In December of 1982, Jim attended the San Francisco screening of The Dark Crystal with many of his friends and colleagues. One such colleague was Brian Froud, a British fantasy illustrator who was responsible for a great many pieces of concept art on The Dark Crystal's production. The same night of the screening, Jim and his friend Brian Froud began talking about their experiences working on The Dark Crystal together. Both Jim and Brian had agreed to never again work on a film of the same magnitude as The Dark Crystal. It was a difficult film to make, and neither of them at the time could have imagined working on another film of equal proportions in the future. But, despite this past agreement, Jim posed an interesting question to Brian on the night of that screening. Jim asked Brian if they should make another movie. This question caught Brian off guard at first, but it didn't take long for him to respond with an emphatic yes. With that said, this madman would spend the next couple years on his next project, Labyrinth. Critical response to The Dark Crystal was largely positive, and the film's box office results were strong enough to assure Henson that he had found a creative niche worthy of further exploration. Although Jim and Brian were determined to push through the dilemmas which blocked their path, it would be a long time before any script would be finalized. The script went through a myriad of iterations and was changed about 25 times before being finalized. Initially, the story was based around the main characters from The Dark Crystal, Jen and Kira, 25 years after the events in The Dark Crystal. As the script would evolve, names would change and eventually the story would focus around a 15-year-old girl named Taya, which would soon have her name changed to Sarah. 
The final script would be approved on April 11th, 1985. I wish the goblins would come and take you away. Our story begins with Sarah, our protagonist. She appears to be speaking as someone of importance, and for a moment, the audience believes that this is a film set in the medieval period, until she forgets a line that she had memorized and retrieves a book from the sleeve of her gown. I can never remember that line. You have no power over me. It turns out that Sarah is not a princess. She's actually a modern teenage girl. A nearby clock chime reminds her that she's late for something back at home. When she realizes this, she runs home as fast as she can in the hurling rain. Hurling? What? When she realizes this, she begins to run home as quickly as she can as rain begins to fall. Oh, it's not fair! When she returns home, her stepmother admonishes her for being late. Oh, really? I'm sorry. Well, don't stand there in the rain. Come on. She was supposed to be home an hour earlier to babysit her baby stepbrother, Toby. You're an hour late. I said I'm Please sorry. Please let me finish. Sarah and her stepmother begin to argue, which soon leads to Sarah dismissing herself from the conversation. Once her parents leave the house, Sarah notices that one of her stuffed animals is missing and discovers that Toby has it. Toby's crying, combined with her current frustration, furthers her irritation. Knock it off. Come on. Stop it! Stop it! She tells Toby that if he doesn't stop crying, she'll wish for him to be taken away by the Goblin King. Eventually, she does make this wish just before shutting Toby's door behind her. I wish the goblins would come and take you away. Right now. Instantly, her brother is taken from her. The sudden silence prompts Sarah to re-enter Toby's room and investigate. She discovers that Toby is gone, and the wish came true. After this discovery, the Goblin King himself makes his appearance. You're him, aren't you? You're the Goblin King. I want my brother back, please, if it's all the same. What's said is said. She regrets asking the Goblin King to take her brother. The Goblin King is played by the great David Bowie, who goes by the name Jareth. This crystal will show her, it will show you your, your dreams. dreams. But it is not a gift for a girl who takes care of a screaming baby. <laughs> he offers Sarah a crystal and tells her that if she agrees to forget about the baby, then she'll be allowed to keep it. She refuses. Next, the Goblin King threatens her with a display of magic. And although she's frightened, she refuses to listen just the same. Finally, the Goblin King makes a deal with her. Jareth tells her that if she can make it to the center of his labyrinth within 13 hours, he'll allow her to leave with her brother. She agrees and is quickly transported to the Goblin King's maze. For the remaining 80 plus minutes of the film, the audience follows Sarah on her journey through Jim Henson's labyrinth. You have 13 hours in which to solve the labyrinth before your baby brother becomes one of us forever. Someone has been in my room again! So let's recap on what we know about Sarah so far. In the beginning, we learn that Sarah forgets to be home by 7 o'clock. When she arrives home, she apologizes to her stepmother, and when she enters her house, her stepmother reprimands her. Let's watch. Sarah, you're an hour late. I said I'm sorry! Please let me finish. And then she says, Your father and I go out very rarely. I go out every single and weekend. And I ask you to babysit only if it won't interfere with your plans. Sarah replies, Well, how do you know? You don't know what my plans are. You don't even ask me anymore. Well, I assume you'd tell me if you had a date. I'd like it if you had a date. You, you should have dates at your age. Us. She walks away saying, All right, you're home. We were worried about I you. I can't do anything right, can I? There's so much to break down in this scene. Okay, so instead of listening to her stepmom, Sarah says that she has already apologized. When she says this, it's as if to say that she doesn't deserve to be reprimanded. This shows us that she's not actually sorry and is just apologizing so she won't be reprimanded. Her stepmother replies by saying, Your father and I go out very rarely. Sarah interrupts her and attempts to justify her actions by saying, I go out every single weekend. Unfortunately for Sarah, she kind of paints herself into a corner with this statement. If it were true that Sarah's stepmom and dad went out every single weekend, then Sarah would have absolutely no excuse for being late. Sarah then tells her stepmother, Well, how do you know? You don't know what my plans are. You don't even ask me anymore. This statement can easily be interpreted as, It's not my fault that I'm late. It's your fault that I'm late. You should have checked what my plans were. But her stepmother replies by saying, Well, I 
assume you'd tell me if you had a date. I'd like it if you had a date. You, you should have dates at your age. Uh, you should have dates at your age. This is a blunt statement coming from her stepmother, but not one intended to hurt Sarah. Her stepmother is essentially telling her that she needs to grow up. Her stepmother is telling her a hard truth right now. With that in mind, i like to connect this moment to the lyrics of David Bowie's song that plays when Sarah's running back in the rain. Don't tell me truth hurts, little girl. Cause it hurts like hell, hurts like hell. This is the face of someone who has just been told the truth, a hard truth. And the truth is, she needs to grow up. Which is exactly what Sarah needs to be told, but this is not what she wants to hear. What can we take away from this quick conversation? We know that she's a young girl who would rather spend her day playing pretend than grow up. She's not very responsible and struggles to understand why life is so unfair. I'd also like to take a moment to discuss the importance of Sarah's room. What I really love about filming is show don't tell. It's this idea that by showing the audience something, it will tell you everything that you need to know a lot better than dialogue will. A really good example of this form of storytelling could be found in the opening scene to Back to the Future. As the camera slowly pans around the room, we get a sense of what Dr. Brown values. It also establishes what we can hope to see in the film going forward. A similar technique is used in the labyrinth. Jim Henson uses this technique when we get a glimpse into Sarah's room. Inside of her room, we discover what she values. She surrounds herself with toys, makeup, trinkets, stuffed animals, and pictures of actors and actresses. One of those pictures is outlined in red, and the word mom is written next to it. This woman is Sarah's mother. This would explain why Sarah holds acting to such a high regard, and why she might hold a certain level of hostility towards her father and stepmother. All right, let's get back to where we left off. So, you can't take anything for granted. Once Jareth leaves Sarah, she takes her first steps towards the labyrinth. At the entrance to the labyrinth, we're introduced to Hoggle, who's going to be a very important character going forward. Excuse me? Oh, uh, excuse me. When Sarah and Hoggle first meet, they do not get off on the right foot. Hoggle sprays a fairy in the face, causing it to fall on the ground. Sarah views this action as despicable until the fairy bites her. You monster! She hadn't expected the fairy to do that, and Hoggle replies by saying, What did you expect fairies to do? And then she replies, I thought they did nice things, like, like granting wishes. Hoggle shrugs and says, huh? Shows what you know, don't it? The reason I bring this up and why I think it's important is because this conversation sets the tone for what Sarah will encounter throughout the rest of the film. <laughs> Horrible! Huh? No, I ain't. I'm Hoggle. Who are you? She's in a new place now, unlike anything she knew previously. She had once thought that fairies were kind creatures and then was bitten by one. This small dose of reality disrupts all of her preconceived notions to what she previously thought to be true. In this world, nothing is like how it appears to be. That's why Jareth is so attractive and why Hoggle is so butt ugly. After a bit of back and forth between Hoggle and Sarah, eventually Hoggle shows Sarah the way inside the labyrinth. When she asks him which way she should go, he replies by saying, Me? I wouldn't go either way. This aggravates Sarah, and when she tells him to leave, Hoggle replies by saying, You know your problem. You take too many things for granted. <laughs> Once Hoggle leaves, Sarah picks a direction to begin walking. After some time, she starts to slow down. There aren't any turns or corners or anything. This just goes on and on. Maybe I'm just taking it for granted that it does. Invigorated, she begins to run through the labyrinth. After some time passes, she slows down again, but this time, in a fit of frustration, she starts striking the surrounding walls before sinking to the floor. A moment later, a talking worm appears and guides her in the way that she should go. Hello. isn't an opening. <laughs> of course there is. You try walking through it, you'll see what I mean. He tells her that things are not always what they seem in this place. So you can't take anything for granted. 
Okay, let's pause for a second. The idea of taking something for granted comes up a lot in this story if you haven't already noticed. So let's try to identify some of the ways Sarah has already shown this. First of all, there are two definitions of this. One, to take for granted is to undervalue or underestimate something or someone. Two, to take for granted is to consider something as being innately or unfailingly true, correct, real, or available. For starters, Sarah undervalues her family. This leads her to wishing her brother would disappear, although she doesn't believe it will actually happen. She also underestimates Hoggle's value, even though he proves himself to be invaluable as a resource of knowledge. He knows his way around the labyrinth and would have been tremendously useful if Sarah hadn't told him to leave. She also underestimates how difficult and dangerous the labyrinth is. She believes that the labyrinth will adhere to logic, but the labyrinth does not follow the rules of logic. With all that in mind, let's continue. It's not fair! She moves along to the next area and discovers that the labyrinth is filled with all manner of tricks. Sarah has the really good idea of using her lipstick to mark the ground so she remembers where she had previously walked through. Unfortunately, this idea does not pan out due to unhelpful intervention. When she discovers this, she says, It's not fair! This statement is also going to be a reappearing line in this film. As the story progresses, Sarah eventually finds herself trapped in an oubliette where she meets Hoggle once again. This is an oubliette. The labyrinth's full of them. Really? I didn't know that. Oh, don't sound so smart. You don't even know what an oubliette is. It's revealed to the audience that Hoggle works for Jareth and has been sent by the Goblin King to lead Sarah back to the start of the labyrinth. Hoggle tells her that he knows a shortcut out of the labyrinth. What you gotta do is get out of here. And it so happens that I know a shortcut out of the whole labyrinth from here. Sarah responds by saying, No, I'm not giving up now. I've come too far. Which is very commendable. Although Sarah is a flawed person, she still has a great deal of courage, and this is something that the audience can appreciate. Sarah then notices that Hoggle has an eye for jewelry, so she haggles with Hoggle. Sarah agrees to give Hoggle her bracelet, and Hoggle agrees to lead her as far as he's willing to go. This scene isn't long, but it plays a small part in the development of Sarah's character. Up until this point, we, as the audience, understand that Sarah has a great deal of attachment for items that belong to her. <sighs> Lancelot! Someone has been in my room again! I hate that! I hate it! By Sarah deciding to let go of her bracelet, we're shown that she's starting to develop some maturity. Hoggle and Sarah go on their way, but eventually run into Jareth. Hello, Hedgeward. Hogwart. Hoggle? He then asks Sarah if she's enjoying his labyrinth, and she states that... It's a piece of cake. Oh. Which prompts Jareth to speed up her deadline. Then Sarah says... It's not fair! And Jareth replies by saying, You say that so often. I wonder what your basis for comparison is. In the next scene, the Goblin King unleashes a deadly mechanical vehicle, which chases Sarah and Hoggle down a tunnel. Sarah and Hoggle manage to narrowly escape death before continuing on their way. It's at this point in the story where we learn a little bit more about Hoggle. He explains to Sarah that he is terrified of Jareth and fears the repercussions of disobedience. You've got to understand my position. I'm a coward and Jareth scares me. The worst form of punishment is to be thrown into a place known as the Bog of The Eternal Stench. And you wouldn't be so brave if you'd ever smelt the Bog of Eternal Stench. Is that all it does, is smell? No, oh, believe me, that's enough. Huggle then tells Sarah that he is leaving. You're on your own from now on. Sarah replies by snatching away Huggle's bag of jewelry. By doing this, Sarah ensures that Huggle will stay by her side. Hoggle yells out, Them's my rightful property! It's not fair! No, it isn't. In this moment, Sarah appears to have learned something. Up until this point, Sarah has often said that her circumstances aren't fair. It's not fair! It's not fair! Oh, it's not fair! 
in this moment, Sarah appears to have reached a point of acceptance, acceptance that life isn't fair and that it isn't meant to be. But that's the way it is. She understands that it serves no purpose for her to continually feel as though the whole world is against her. It does not help you to believe that the world owes you something for all the unfairness delivered upon you. It is better to realize that life is not fair to anyone and move forward. However, I cannot fault Hoggle one bit for being upset. If I were in his shoes, I'd be twice as mad. The agreement between Hoggle and Sarah was vague at best. I'll, I'll tell you what, if you won't take me to the center, take me as far as you can, and then I'll do it on my own. I said I didn't promise nothing. I said I'd take you as far as I could go. He said that he was willing to take her as far as he was willing to go, and he fulfilled that agreement and was punished for it. I want to point out something else before we move on. Sarah's action of stealing Hoggle's bag is a pretty low move, but it does inform us that Sarah no longer takes Hoggle for granted. She is now aware that Hoggle possesses a wealth of knowledge, unlike the beginning of the story when she told Hoggle to leave. leave. She is able to recognize that Hoggle appreciates jewelry. You like jewelry, don't you? Why? And takes it away from him. By doing this, Hoggle doesn't leave her, and the odds that Sarah will find her brother before the time runs out increases. I ain't never been no one's friend before. In the next scene, Sarah approaches a man with the intent to ask him questions regarding the labyrinth. Instead of asking who she is, the old man asks who Hoggle is. Uh, and who is this? Huh. My friend. Uh. This statement appears to catch Hoggle off guard. The old man doesn't offer Sarah a direct answer and soon falls asleep. Once Sarah is through speaking with the old man, she is expected to give him an offering. She removes a ring from her finger and drops it into the cup. This shows us that Sarah is starting to grow a little bit. Before, she was willing to sacrifice her bracelet in exchange for information. Now she's at the point where she's willing to sacrifice her ring, knowing that she won't receive anything in return. Sarah and Hoggle continue on their way. Hoggle asks her why she regarded him as a friend. Why? Why did you say that about my being your friend? Sarah replies by saying, Because you are. Hoggle tells her, I ain't never been no one's friend before. Then, before Sarah can reply, a loud growl erupts from nearby, which frightens Hoggle away. As Hoggle begins to run, Sarah confronts him by asking, Wait a minute! Keep the stuff! Are you my friend or not? Hoggle denies this and runs off. No, no, I'm not! The last thing he tells her is, Hoggle is Hoggle's friend! Hoggle? You coward! Although Hoggle's excited about the prospect of having Sarah as a friend, he is still primarily motivated by fear at this point in the story. Sarah then meets her next companion. This is Ludo, a large creature who's been strung up by a bunch of goblins. Sarah wants to help him, but can't think of what to do. Ludo begins to howl, which causes a rock to roll towards Sarah. Sarah throws the rock and hits one of the goblins. Ludo howls again, and another rock ends up by Sarah. This shows us that Ludo might have some sort of rock summoning ability. When the goblins inevitably run off, Sarah helps Ludo down, and we discover that not only is Ludo friendlier than how he appears, but that he's probably just as lost as Sarah is. He then asks her, Friend? And she replies, That's right, Ludo. Sarah continues her journey with Ludo by her side, and soon they find themselves in a forest. Unbeknownst to Sarah, Ludo is plunged below the ground. When she discovers this, she begins to call for him. Elsewhere, Hoggle hears Sarah call out for him, and when he hears this, he replies by saying, Hoggle, help! I'm coming, Sarah. Well, if it isn't you. Jareth prevents Hoggle from leaving. He also tosses Hoggle a crystal, which changes into a peach. What is it? It's a present. Jareth tells Hoggle to deliver that peach to Sarah. It ain't gonna hurt the little lady, is it? Oh, now why the concern? Jareth tells Hoggle that if he doesn't do as he says, he'll throw him into the bog of stench. You'll give her that, Hoggle, or I'll tip you straight into the bog of eternal stench before you can blink. And just before leaving, Jareth says this. And Hoggle, if she ever kisses you, I'll turn you into a prince. Y you will? Prince of the land of stench! <laughs> With that in mind, Hoggle eventually finds Sarah and rescues her from a group known as the Fire Gang. As a way to say thank you, Sarah begins kissing Hoggle on the cheek. 
When this happens, Hoggle is sent on a pathway directed towards the Bog of Eternal Stench, with Sarah following close behind. The Bog of Eternal Stench! Hoggle nearly falls into the bog, but is quickly held by Sarah before he loses his grip. Ah, what is it? It's the Bog of Eternal Stench! When Sarah helps pull him to his feet, Hoggle voices his frustration at Sarah for kissing him. Sarah replies by saying, I know you came back to help me. And I know that you're my friend. Hoggle denies their friendship and insists that the only reason he saved her from the fire gang was because he wanted his bag of jewels returned to him. Hoggle and Sarah soon bump into Ludo, who went missing a few scenes before. Ludo! <laughs> Together, the three of them begin to look for a way out and eventually come across a bridge, which appears to provide a way across the bog. As the three make their way there, they encounter a creature that blocks their path. This is Sir Didymus. He has sworn by his life blood that nobody will cross that bridge without his permission. Hoggle and Ludo begin to lament over the stench of the bog nearby, which confuses Didymus because he possesses no sense of smell. Oh. <laughs> I smell nothing. Sir Didymus engages Hoggle and Ludo in a duel, which prompts Ludo to defend himself. Seizing his opportunity, Hoggle rushes across the bridge, leaving his companions behind. In no time, Ludo defeats Sir Didymus. Enough! By doing this, it affords the three an opportunity to become acquainted with one another. Sarah asks Sir Didymus if they can cross the bridge with his permission. I have sworn with my life blood, no one shall pass this way without my permission. Well, may we have your permission? To which he replies, well, I, uh, 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 <laughs> yes? When Sarah attempts to cross the bridge, the structure begins to collapse, which causes Sarah to lose her footing. She grabs hold of a nearby branch, which saves her from falling into the bog. Hoggle returns to see Sarah in trouble and makes one of the most terrifying faces I've ever seen. In fact, when I think about it, this entire movie is filled with terrifying faces. This one especially. Seeing Sarah in trouble, Ludo begins howling, which summons nearby rocks and boulders to move according to where he needs them to go. This ability of Ludo's was hinted at earlier. Canst thou summon up the very rocks? Sure, rocks friends. Once Sarah is saved, she and Ludo make their way across the bog. Then it's revealed that Sir Didymus has a dog named Ambrosius. This dog looks very similar to Sarah's dog, Merlin. Just close your eyes and go! As the group of travelers make their way towards the exit, Hangul stays back from the rest. He wordlessly contemplates dropping Jareth's peach. Ah, there's so many complicated words in the sentence, I can't say it. He begins contemplating dropping Jareth's peach into the bog, but is interrupted by the Goblin King's ethereal voice. I wouldn't do that if I were you. This scene continues to reinforce the conflict within Hoggle. Oh, please. I can't give it to her. Hoggle, what have you done? At this point in the story, Sarah and her companions begin to wonder where they can find some food. This provides Hoggle with an opportunity to give Sarah the peach, which he does. Sarah says that it tastes strange and asks Hoggle, Hoggle, what have you done? Hoggle then says, Oh. Damn you, Jared. And damn me, too. From the Goblin King's castle, we get the iconic shot of him sitting on his windowsill. Sarah begins to imagine people dance as the spheres slowly make their way into her periphery. Not before long, Sarah falls asleep. And in the next scene, we see her dressed exactly as the woman from the music box she had kept in her room. As the music plays, Sarah discovers that Jareth is across the room from her. He disappears from view, only to reappear moments later, staring at her from far away. Sarah appears to be searching for Jareth, despite the Goblin King being only a few feet away from her. He remains out of sight intentionally as she makes her way throughout the room. Eventually, Jareth appears in front of her, which is when they begin to dance. There's something you need to know, and that is I'm Chris Hansen, and this is an investigation called Hansen vs. Predator. The two dance for a short while as the music continues. Sarah locks eyes with the Goblin King and seems to be captivated by him. Moments later, her captivation is interrupted by the laughter of those around her. This laughter continues and divides her attention from Jareth. 
Out of the corner of her eye, she spies a nearby clock which indicates that only an hour remains until her baby brother is lost. This realization provides her with the necessary motivation to separate herself from the dance. She finds what appears to be an exit and uses a chair nearby to smash the glass holding her captive. This action disrupts the entire illusion and causes her to fall back into reality and onto a pile of clutter. It's all junk. In the next scene, we find Hoggle sitting at a fire bemoaning the loss of his only friend. She'll never forgive me. He regrets his actions and is convinced that she will never forgive him. Back with Sarah, she wakes up and finds that she's in a different location than she was before. Sarah tosses the peach away, sits up, and begins meandering around the junk. <laughs> Once she tosses the peach away, Sarah bumps into the ugliest woman I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I just look at her. <laughs> Once she tosses the peach away, Sarah bumps into an old woman who is lumbering around non-essential items on her back. Sarah can't remember who she's searching for or where she was going. Upon hearing this, the old woman hands her a teddy bear, which looks identical to Lancelot, the bear from her room back home. The old woman leads Sarah to a place that looks identical to her bedroom. Sarah leaps onto her bed, and after a moment, she sits up and remarks that everything must have been a dream. It was just a dream. Of course, these remarks turn sour once she opens her bedroom door. Sarah stands by as the old woman wanders into her room. The old woman attempts to distract Sarah from her current circumstances by handing her an assortment of keepsakes scattered around the room. Sarah is handed stuffed animals, toys, trinkets, baubles, and makeup. Eventually, the items begin to weigh on Sarah and become too much to carry. This imagery displays the weight of these items on Sarah as a burden to her. Sarah appears numb to the situation around her until she picks up the book that she was reading in the beginning of the story. I fought my way here to the castle. She reads, Take back the child that you have stolen. Once Sarah says this, she becomes reminded of what she must do and where she must go. It's all junk. Sarah finally realizes that these items are meaningless compared to what she has to do. She can't afford to play pretend and hide in her room any longer. She must continue her journey and save her brother. As she comes to this realization, the room begins to crumble around her. The walls are peeled away as Sir Didymus and Ludo call out for her. She makes her way towards the sound of their voices and appears to be reinvigorated. Why, did, why does this not sound good? She makes her way towards the sound of their voices. The city is close by now, and they are very close to completing their journey. I forgive you, Hoggle. As our group make their way through the entrance of the Goblin City, the doors close behind them. As they take a few steps forward, the metal doors in front of them shut as well. When the doors close, it's revealed that the entrance is guarded by a metallic gatekeeper. <laughs> Hidden spikes shoot out from behind them as the gate creeper, as cre <laughs> gate creeper? <laughs> Hidden spikes shoot out from behind them as the gatekeeper grabs hold of his axe nearby. The gatekeeper begins swinging his axe wildly as the group appears to be trapped. Then, from the top of the entrance, Hoggle jumps onto the head of the gatekeeper. He rips the head off, exposing the pilot. The weapon gets lodged into the wall above as the gatekeeper begins to malfunction. Then Hoggle jumps out just as the gatekeeper? <laughs> the Hoggle jumps out just as the gatekeeper explodes. Hoggle falls to the ground with a thud. Sarah tries to help him, but is pushed away. Hoggle says, I'm not asking to be forgiven. I ain't ashamed of nothing I did. Cherith made me give you that peach. In reality, Hoggle is ashamed of what he did and can't forgive himself. He believes that he doesn't deserve forgiveness and rejects Sarah before she has a chance to reject him. He would rather be the one to push her away because he knows that it would hurt him much more if she pushed him away. Despite his words, Sarah can see straight through him. I forgive you, Hoggle. And Hoggle is caught completely off guard by this. Sir Didymus adds, Rarely have I seen such courage. You are a valiant man, Sir Hoggle. Then Ludo says, Hoggle and Ludo friends. 
It's at this point that Sarah returns Hoggle's bag of jewels. Here are your things, Hoggle. Oh. Hoggle is happy to have his property returned to him, but he doesn't seem to care about them anymore. He didn't risk his life trying to save Sarah because he wanted his jewels back. He did it for her because she was his friend. With our group reunited, they head into the Goblin City. While this is happening, Jareth is alerted to Sarah's presence and orders his goblins to stop them. She must be stopped! Do something! Sarah and her friends are met with an army of goblins. Oh, pizza cake. <laughs> the goblins charge at them while firing cannons. Sir Didymus fights on his own while the remaining three hide inside a house in the center of the goblin city. Don't worry, Ambrosius. I think we've got them surrounded. In the midst of the battle, Sarah reminds Ludo to call the rocks, which he does. Rocks of all shapes and sizes begin filling the streets, crushing everything in their path. This provides our heroes with an opportunity to escape in the confusion and head for Jareth's castle. Heavy men, hold your ground! Our heroes push their way through and are now very close to the end. Sarah says, I have to face him alone. But why? Yes. Because that's the way it's done. With that said, Sarah makes her way up the stairs and quickly discovers that rescuing her brother will be trickier than anticipated because this room is crazy. Sarah makes her way up the stairs and quickly discovers that rescuing her brother will be trickier than anticipated. Everywhere she seems to go, Toby is taken away from her. All the while, Jareth continues to present himself as a distraction for Sarah, but fails. With Toby in her sights, she jumps into the air as everything around her begins to collapse. You have no power over me. Sarah stands in the center of the room while Jareth slowly emerges from the darkness. She starts to recite the words from her book as we saw in the beginning of the film. Here's a little side-by-side -side comparison for you. Give me the child. Through dangers untold and hardships unnumbered, I have fought my way here to the castle beyond the Goblin City. He tells her that he took Toby away at her request. Everything you have wanted, I have done for you. He concludes his list of generous deeds by stating that he is exhausted from living up to her expectations of him. The scene continues and Sarah recites the lines from the beginning of the film. For my will is as strong as yours. And my Jareth stops her before she can finish and reminds her of what she stands to lose. Look what I am offering you. This mirrors the beginning of the film when he says... It'll show you your dreams. Here he's presenting her with the opportunity to see her dreams, avoid responsibility, and avoid growing into a mature adult. She ignores his words and continues to recite. And my kingdom is great. Just before Sarah can finish speaking, she appears to have forgotten her line, just like the beginning of the film. My kingdom is great. Kingdom is great. With a couple seconds remaining on the clock, Sarah remembers her line and says, You have no power over me. Once she says this, Jareth falls from her view as she is transported back to her home. She rushes to Toby and finds him safe and sound. Toby is fast asleep, and Sarah willingly gives him her teddy bear. Here you are. I'd like Lancelot to belong to you now. She has grown as a person and has learned to accept responsibility. She appreciates Toby and no longer takes her family for granted. Back in her room, just as her parents are returning home, Sarah can see the reflection of her friends in the mirror. She tells her friends that she needs them, and in the next moment, they arrive in her room and begin to celebrate. From outside her window, Jareth silently watches them until he eventually disappears, flying off into the distance. The film ends here, but this is just the beginning of the film's legacy. I, I love doing what I do. I can't imagine anybody else, you know, uh, having as much fun in their work as I do. At the box office, reviews of The Labyrinth were mixed, to say the least. While some papers noted the film's artistry, other publications were unimpressed considering Jim Henson's prior work. Labyrinth was made on a budget of $25 million and debuted during the summer at a time when 21 major pictures came out in a span of three weeks. 
Labyrinth was number eight in the US box office charts, which placed it behind The Karate Kid Part Two, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Top Gun, and others. In its next weekend at the box office, the film dropped to number 13 in the charts. By the end of its run in US cinemas, the film had earned under $13 million. By comparison, Top Gun was the highest grossing film of 1986. It was made on a budget of $15 million and made $176 million in the US alone. It wouldn't be until years after the film's release where Jim Henson's Labyrinth would slowly develop a more widespread fandom. Thank you for watching part one. Here's what you can expect from part two. It includes the discussion of Sarah's archetype, Greek mythology, The Wizard of Oz, and an in-depth discussion on Jareth's character. Feel free to like, subscribe, and leave a comment, and I'll talk to you guys soon. The bog of eternal stench.